Okay, so our next speaker is Loe Lurry. Loe is a senior embedded systems engineer professional who is addicted to anything related to technology and programming, always trying to make a bridge between the electronics engineering and software engineering worlds, which he believes will provide amazing results from innovation and technology perspectives. Uh, the topic of Lohe's presentation is emulating retro game consoles on embedded systems with RT Thread. And I love retro game consoles. So over to you, Lohe. Hello. Hello. Yeah. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay, I will start with the presentation. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to this uh, session of the RT3 conference 2022. I will be the representing of this session. It's about emulating uh, retro game console on embedded system with uh, RT3 uh, RTOS. So about uh, the uh, my name, uh, as I say, my name is Luai. I uh, work as embedded systems engineer. It came from the, my background as a hobby and a study. I have been uh, here in Shenzhen for almost uh, eight years. And uh, the way it motivated me to come here because it's like the Silicon Valley of electronics. You can uh, prototype or design anything in just blink of eye, like two days, three days, everything is ready from BCB to ordering component to soldering, try everything. Uh, I, I am the founder of uh, Yari for Embedded Company. It's a, a small company for uh, consultation, for hardware, firmware development. Also, I uh, provide uh, services for speeding up uh, product prototyping. If anyone have a prototyping idea and need to move to the next step of uh, commercializing it or making in the manufacturing step. Also, I have worked with many uh, big company for providing test automation support for the testing jig or testing steps during the manufacturing uh, process. In this uh, presentation, we will talk about uh, video game emulation. In general, uh, it's the main reason why I came to the world of embedded uh, electronics, as I like before uh, to know how the video game console work, how or when the accessories uh, like the joystick or the video output or the RF, how we can change it from the composite uh, signals. All this thing I didn't know until I studied the electronics and then later uh, try to hack it or tweak it with the new technology. So we will talk also about the benefit of developing emulator, especially for uh, students or people who want to uh, understand the computer architecture, uh, studying the low level of the computer architecture, like when go getting deeper in the assembly language, how to write interpreter, how to address, uh, how to understand the memory management, uh, also the interfacing with the peripheral. And we will talk about some real life implementations, like we are using it by, uh, by getting the emulator. Also, we will mention about the which uh, any game emulator, what is the main components, uh, what we need. And uh, why, uh, later, how we will start and where to start, like uh, how to get deep from the basic uh, entry until we're getting more deeper, deeper to more advanced and difficult emulators. Uh, for uh, this uh, situation, we will uh, talk briefly about the Chip 8 uh, emulator. It's a famous uh, interpreter. Where, uh, if you search on the internet, it's been uh, since the 1970s. Uh, people are trying to do uh, emulator and prop, uh, interpreter for many. Uh, architecture and many PCs and devices. Also, we will see how we can uh, implement this implementation using low cost uh, of the shelf uh, component. 
like you are uh, doing any like blinking uh, LED on Arduino. And we used the uh, RT3 uh, as uh, this implementation for two purposes to to get to know how to work uh, on RT3, how to use the existing component, and maybe in the future how to uh, give more support to the component library of the RT3 Studio. Also, we'll talk about the improvements and the fu future steps. Like uh, after we finish this step, what we can do to uh, get uh, more in advance in this uh, topic. So, what uh, is emulation? In uh, computing, an emulator is hardware or software that enables one computer system called the host to behave like another computer system called the guest. In another world, like uh, like let's say we have uh, some application was uh, written using the uh, 68K uh, from Motorola with uh, Trusted and uh, was implemented in a big system. And the big system we don't want to change, but only the, let's say like the small uh, terminal or devices like which running on this core is getting aging and we need to replace in somehow. But instead of rewriting all the software uh, to work on the new one, we just create like uh, interpreter for the uh, guest uh, host. Like we use, let's say we used ARM or RISC-V uh, uh, CPU architecture to interpret all the software or OS and run on the new system. In this case, we we will reduce the time consumption of rewriting the software and maintaining it and fixing the error. At the same time, we can understand the old architecture and how to improve it and understand more the new architecture. Uh, as an example, we have like uh, the DOS box. Many fans of the old uh, gaming like in the 90 the late 80 and 90 there were many famous game on can only run on those so people want to use it again uh, without writing so you can just install it on mobile phone or like android or on the pcs and you can run any old titles the famous one also there is another uh, implementation i found it like in many supermarket when they have like uh, the old uh, point of sale system which is run on the DOS uh, UI. It's just uh, the shortcut using the F1 to F12 uh, on the keyboard and all the implementation. Actually they use the exact old uh, software, the POS software, but using emulators. So you will find it uh, running on like uh, the ARM uh, SOCs, which are uh, used in the tablet or used in the uh, TV box, it's the same uh, chips. Uh, about the game emulation components, when we want to get any uh, hardware and uh, we want to try to emulate it, the first thing we we understand that how to interact with is the input, like the user or the player we start playing with the they should have like uh, the keypad the joystick or have a keyboard and mouse to give the input key and the movement also we need the graphics outputs so anything the screen will be printed uh, will drawing all the graphics from the old time it was like on monochrome screen with the low resolution pixel like in the 32 by 64 or 128. Uh, uh, also we need that. Zoe, it just struck me, uh, are you sharing slides at all? You cannot see the slides? No, it, it, I, I thought you were just talking and now I've just realized that maybe you were oh. sharing your slides and we're not seeing them. Can you see it now? Uh, yes. Well, we can see the uh -huh. uh, PowerPoint window, not the full screen. Yes. Perfect. 
Sorry. Sorry, it just struck me. I, uh, you know, I, th I thought you were just talking mm. away. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. So I just uh, switched directly to what we talked about. This is about the agenda and what about the emulation. And this is the photo of the DOS box example. When you uh, run mini DOS to uh, execute uh, some old uh, application using the emulator. Now we are talking about the game emulation component. So we first we talk about the key input, like if we have a gamepad or keyboard or a mouse. Also we have the graphics output. And uh, to show the what's going on on the screen, like anything like if the player moving or like playing Tetris, you can see the blocks. Also the audio outputs. So the old uh, emulator, it, in the old era, it was just a simple uh, buzzing sound, uh, like uh, you just uh, generate some fixed frequency as on or off to uh, give some indicator. Also, the main game emulation component, we need the software itself, so we call it ROM. So ROM for the read-only memory, at that time, is was the key of selling for the video game. So when you we buy the console, we buy it as, let's say, low price, supported by the company who produce it, because their uh, revenue came from the uh, titles they will produce later by other studios. And uh, at that time, the, let's say the bottleneck or something expensive what was the way, the size of the, the capacity of the memory and how to store it. So. At the beginning, it was uh, starting like saving it on tapes. So when you get Commodore, you have uh, some cassette player and you need to load the uh, application by rewinding all the cassette tape and hearing all the noise. And this noise will be translated to one and zero. And then when you finish loading the cassette, it will be loaded inside the RAM memory of the system. Then you can start playing or executing the application. And later it uh, started as uh, OTP memory, like the cartridge. When you start with Atari or uh, S uh, Sega or NES uh, system, it was just uh, a parallel uh, me memory. You have uh, address and data, and you can uh, directly access it to the uh, memory box of the system. Uh, after that, uh, it's uh, changed to the uh, the cheaper one, it was like the optical uh, disc from CDs to DVD, then Blu-ray. And the final one now, when we have a few, uh, when we have a better uh, bandwidth on the internet, everything turned to like digital services. So you need to go to the market and buy it and download it using your uh, the internet connection. The latest thing we, and the important one, we need the guest architecture. Like, so first we need to check when we get any system that we want to try to emulate that which uh, core or CPU are based on. Like if we go to the, uh, let's say the Sega, Sega Genesis or Mega Drive, it's uh, based on the Motorola 68K. And uh, if you go to the, let's say to the Go Game Boy, the Game Boy one was uh, some kind of modified uh, architecture based on the Z80 with some special uh, uh, instructions set. So, so when we get this, we need to get also the memory map and we need to get uh, all the interrupt and how we can access the GPIO. And based on that, we will start uh, implementing the first, uh, the core of the emulator. And for people like it will be like at, uh, at the beginning is difficult. It's better to find, there are many uh, open source uh, soft core. Like if we want to search for something, we just search for the 68 core. And then we get, uh, it, it's like we brought the CPU and we put it on board and we start uh, connecting with it. And for the memory, it will be basically like uh, we will load it inside the 
uh, an array, byte array, if we are writing in C language. So it's now easier than an old time. So for where to start? Like, if we want to start from the zero, like uh, if someone doesn't know anything about emulation or how to do it, the the best recommendation all of all people who were already wrote a huge emulator that they started from Chip8. Uh, Chip8 basically is not a, how to say, hardware architecture. It's an interpreted uh, programming languages. And uh, it was developed by Joseph uh, Weisbaker in the late 1970s. Uh, he, he was used uh, the COSMAC, the IP and TELMAC uh, 1800 8-bit microcomputer. And then the ship 8 ran inside a virtual machine. So in this way, it was allowed to uh, allow the video game to be more easily programmed for these computers. And then later, uh, since that time, everyone has possible to uh, port it to another architecture. That's why it's uh, still famous until now. And many people, they are writing uh, a program on this uh, virtual machine. So when if we build one uh, now uh, using the RT3 letter, if uh, anyone wants to learn the assembly or how to, how to write Hello World program using the ship 8, you can implement it easy, easily. So for the ship 8 main applications, we have uh, many classic video games. Uh, so the famous one, uh, Pong, it's uh, an easy game. It's like the tennis. So we have two bars here, and uh, we have uh, one pixel that's going from uh, right to left. And each bar needs to go up and down. So once you get uh, once you dodge this pixel it's uh, fine when you if it's go, uh, gone be behind the bar you will uh, miss one and the other opponents will get a score uh, the other game uh, the famous one is uh, also the space invader so we have a small ship that it will uh, shoot about aliens going down also we have the tetris this is the most addicted uh, a blocks game that you the idea is to uh, complete one line and you will uh, score it and for each level it will increase the speed and we have also the pac-man this uh, the yellow one all of these were already implemented later on chip 8 we have also many uh, famous applications like random maze generator and conway games of life so let's go to the chip 8 specification. We have the, first we have the memory. The memory map, uh, we see it's, uh, the memory addressing is like the 4K. This was based on the first uh, architecture that they designed for. And the application, mostly we start uh, at 512. So it will be 200. Uh, in hexadecimal. Uh, for the other application, it's for this the 600 is for the ETI 660 uh, chip. Uh, it's a program, but it's out of the scope now. We will not use it. About the register, chip uh, uh, 8 have 16 general uh, purpose it's uh, bit registers, and we referred it to the V's, VX, like from V1 to VF. Also, we have a uh, 16-bit register called I. This register, uh, usually, we use it for sto uh, storing memory addresses. And based on the addressing, we only need to use 12-bit uh, in reality for it. About the keypad, uh, it's the, basically, it's the hex keypad. So it's 4 by 4 and uh, Usually, we can implement it by hardware by using matrices, like we have uh, four co uh, columns and uh, four rows. And we make uh, four of this uh, row as input and uh, four as output. And we do cycling about it. And we see which, uh, when uh, 
the output as turning to one, which one is reading one, which one is reading zero. We can the address which uh, keys are pressed. About the display, for the chip, it, uh, the first version of it, uh, it's have uh, 32 by 64 uh, uh, bit uh, resolution. So in our implementation, now this is a small uh, resolution. If we want to use uh, in our implementation, like we use the OLED displays with the small size, uh, it will be super tiny. We cannot uh, see it. That, uh, we need to do some rescaling later to, in order to make it more readable. So like uh, the scaling is getting each uh, pixel and multiply by two or four based on the scale uh, level. We have also in the chip at uh, virtual machine uh, two timers. So one delay timer and one sound timer. The delay timer does not uh, do anything more than subtracting one value of the delay timer at rate of 60 hertz. And the reason of the 60 hertz refresh it is because all the all the old system like video game or uh, computer they were based on the CRT display which have uh, 60 hertz refresh rate in the US or 50 hertz in uh, Europe. So based on that, they made all the refreshing time synchronized with this one. And uh, sometime with the blanking time, they will do all the interrupts to not be uh, noticeable by the end user while doing the playing. Like when we read the input or anything using the blanking. Uh, also, the delay timer, once it's reached zero, it will, uh, it will automatically deactivate. The sound uh, timer, the idea is non-zero. So it will uh, also decrement, but how, how uh, ever, how long as the uh, sound timer is greater than zero, it will keep generating the uh, sound. So it should be when reaching the zero, the sound timer should be deactivated. And uh, for the simplicity, the, this uh, sound uh, timer was using uh, using just a simple like controlling LED. So we can just uh, when we turn on or off by just logic uh, bit, and by the end of this logic bit, we can use a ready-made uh, buzzer, which uh, it's contain internal. Uh, a resonator that will generate frequency when it's on and it will be off when uh, uh, in zero logic. For the hardware implementation, we uh, grab the famous 4x4 four four, uh, hex keypad and we connect it to the GPIO for four uh, columns and for four rows. And we get the SSD 1306 OLED display. Uh, 128 uh, pixel by 64. So we will do the scaling by, by doubling, and we will see the difference when it's uh, without scale and with the scale. Uh, this display can work in both I square C and uh, SPI, the controller. But uh, for simplicity now, we just use the ready-made I square uh, C one, and we use the library which is available in the RT3 Studio component. Uh, for the buzzer, as I mentioned before, it's contained the uh, frequency uh, uh, generator inside. So we just implement uh, logic, either one or zero, it will buzz based on that for a period of time, based on the emulator. Uh, the final board, uh, I used the uh, component, like uh, any DIY project, and it was maybe less than 10 USD to, is not uh, expensive. And I use the uh, famous STM32, uh, the board, uh, we call it a blue, a blue pill. It's based on the uh, Cortex M3, the MCU with the 128 kilobyte of uh, flash and the 20 kilobyte of RAM. So let's go to the see the implementation of the project.
So can you see the camera? Yes, we can see it now. Yeah. So I put uh, the camera here. We have the project. And this is the. This is the screen. Sorry for this. Okay. Okay, so we have, uh, I will show how we started uh, the project first, uh, if we have time. We start a new RT-Thread project, and then we write the, the name of the project. Then we select the board. And the board, we uh, can get it uh, ready from uh, the BSP from the SDK manager. We need to install the blue pill. Uh, for, the, for the debugger, I am using the ST-Link. We are using SWD. And then uh, we use the latest uh, version of RT thread and we click Finish. Now it will uh, create the RT thread project. It will take uh, some time. This based on the device, uh, but uh, the Windows uh, station here is uh, a little bit of the other one. I'm using Mac OS, so hopefully in the future we can use uh, the RT thread studio on Mac OS also. I think it's taking more time because uh, while we are doing the streaming, okay, it's say uh, done here. So when while uh, it's done, we highlight it by clicking on the project. Like when we have many projects at the same time, we select the project we need, and then we uh, do the 
option like changing the setting or build or anything else. So first thing we change the debugger setting that once we download the reset mode, we click it to system reset. It means that after the debugger will uh, flash the, the memory, it will auto reset it. No need to press the reset button on the kit itself. And then we click build. Inside the while it's building, we will get uh, what uh, the blue pill PSP default one will give us. It will define the LED zero pin that uh, it, we need to know the RT3 pin number inside the RT Thread Studio because on the RT Thread Studio they separate, separate the layers between the hardware and the uh, software in order to be more portable between different architecture. So for C13, uh, this macro will give the real number for the LED zero pin. So maybe it will be like number 22, 23. Then this is the application it show that it will uh, do the normal blink and we can see it uh, it will blink like a half second for the main application after after that if we need to add the uh, component, we just go to the RT thread settings. Taking some time here. I think the problem is that you've got the two cameras running and the network and the teams and yeah, <laughs> and things, think things always and, uh, go slowly already... when you're in a hurry. Yeah. So in the package center, we uh, before that first we need to enable the I square C. So we enable the I square C and then we select the config. And we are using here the GPIO, uh, the, so it's the soft uh, I2C, it's not the hardware I2C for many reasons. First, uh, to make it easier if we want to change the pin based on the schematic uh, and the BCB layout. And the other thing is uh, because we are using the STM32, the first generation, the F1 uh, family, uh, it has some uh, 
Errata C2 corrects the GPIO is not stable, but in the new generation is more, it was more stable if we want to use the M4 or, or later one. Uh, first, we need to enable using I square C device driver, and then we use the GPIO to simulate the I square C. After that, if we uh, we need to save the RT thread setting. When you see here the stars, we need to save it to get the configuration in effect. Once we save it, we need uh, we try to uh, rebuild, and when it's rebuilt, it will uh, ask for to populate which pin number of the I square C devices, a device number uh, like which pin pin 22, 23. If we didn't mention it, it will give error here. So as it's building uh, normally, I will show how to add the component and then we go directly to the final project because we are running off, out of time. Uh, later I can share on the on the GitHub the repository of the whole project if anyone interested in um, improving it or modifying. So here when we go to the package center, We have two important uh, packages. Uh, I use it uh, during this uh, development. So if we search for I square C, There is a tool called I square C tools. This one is too important for debugging the first step that whether we can see the I square C device or not. Because the easier way it will uh, go around all to check all the addresses from I square C from 1 to 127. And uh, the one it will available, it will uh, knock back, it will give the address that it's available. It's a, a very similar uh, tool on the Raspberry Pi when we want to use it in the in the shell. So this one is uh, the same. And the other one is the display driver. So once we add it, we go back here, we will find it here. So for the I square C tools, we need to set up whether it's using software I square C or using the bus of the RT thread system itself. So if we use the software I square C, We need then to define the pin outs, the data and the clock. 
for it. If we didn't enable this, it will follow the setting of the I2C uh, driver of the RT thread system. Here, I think we have issue with, with accessing GitHub. It depends on the VPN. So sometimes when we get this error, fail to download software package, it means I cannot access the repository because all the component are on the RT thread uh, GitHub repo. So, so let's go to the final version now for now and see how it's uh, working. So I uh, will flash it. So as we can, can we see the screen now? Okay, let me try to use the phone. As we can see here is the screen without uh, scaling up. So we can see how much small the Tetris game. We cannot, uh, it's barely available because each block is just four, uh, four pixels. So in order to, if we scale it, This is the bigger size because we double the scale. And we are using the keypad for right and left and flipping it and getting down. Uh, this uh, implementation was using the Tetris uh, ROM. I will uh, show how to load the ROM and how we say, save it. Here we define the pinout for the keyboard, and then we create uh, two arrays for the row and the pins for easier changing later. And then I added two rooms. For the rooms of the chip, it is too small. It can reach up to 2K or 3 kilobyte. This one is like 400 byte. So there is the space invaders. And we have the Tetris, the one I just uh, ran it. And we define here the pins for the SDA, the data on the clock for the I2C, and the LEDs, which is blinking. And then uh, the pin for the, uh, this one is for the speaker. So when there is a sound, it will just uh, give one or zero, like controlling the LED. And then we define the color of the display that the, this is for the emulator, the pixel on and pixel of which uh, color. So we can invert the screen if we want the opposite uh, show. And we have this uh, uh, function put pixel. So based on this uh, setting, if it's uh, true, it will uh, scale up the pixel for four bits. You see, it will draw it four times. Else, it will draw it one time, which it will be small. And this is, this is for uh, drawing the intro, the first one. It's just uh, 
already from the library itself. I get it from the RT thread uh, component. You, we, we select which cursor on the X and Y, and then we write the text under which font. Is it and what the color, with it, whether it's uh, flipped or not. And this uh, macro is the most important for debugging or testing on the way. Because uh, when we use it, any function we create, we add it, and then we create, uh, write the function name and the example. So it will be like when you use any tool on the Linux shape. That uh, okay, you can test each uh, function separately. No need to run the main application to get it. So let's see how to run here. So this is the shell. If we click that, it will show the help. And then it will show that it's on the list because we add it here. Any function we will add, it will appear here on the list. So I made a function like print room. It will uh, just uh, go for forward, for loop and print all the bytes as an example. And the draw intro, it will uh, draw the display when we click it. So once we hit enter, you will see that it will display uh, draw uh, the welcome screen. But it will clear again because the main loop is still uh, interpreting the ship its output for each cycle. This is the function for initiate uh, the key. So when we want the row to be an output, we just uh, call the function RT pin mode, and we put the pin number from the definition on top, and then we put output. And for the input, we need it with pull down, like a resistor to pull down. So to reduce the uh, complexity of uh, assembling the BCD, we use the built-in pull down for the GPIO by using this uh, option, pin mode input pull down. And then this function, the key read, will return uh, the return I put it 32 but it can be 16 because each uh, key it will represent one bit from 0 to 16 so based on that i will it will be glue to the uh, game uh, button this function it will connect to the emulator uh, ship 8 emulator so the emulator will know which button we pressed it this for the th uh, creating threads options and this is the thread one entry it's for the blinking led while we are uh, playing the emulator so it's separated one and the thread two entry during the while loop we do the following we call this function emulate cycle which will do all the ship eight interpretation for each cycle from the 60 hertz and from that we get if there is a beep uh, it's mean if there is sound, we play sound. I uh, made it like uh, 100 uh, millisecond and turn it off. And if there is a draw flag, it's mean to update the screen. So we draw the screen. Also, uh, we make a loop for the X and Y. If it's uh, with double pixel, we make it from 0 to 32. It's mean by multiply by two. If it's not, it will be in the center of screen, small one. And after we finish all the drawing, we call this function called uh, to update the screen, to change uh, everything. And then we update the game button, and that's it. This is the whole uh, emulator. For the imp improvement, if we go to the inside the emulator, we can see the timer, how it's two timer, it's working for uh, decrementing. And for the game, it's just a loading application. It's copy memory to the address location. 
uh, which is the memory plus 512 because we say in the that the memory will start from 512. So now uh, for the opcode and all this, we can change it by uh, improve the performance of the emulator by using assembly uh, instruction, translating the assembly structure of the ghost uh, guest uh, uh, system on the host system. It will be more uh, high efficiency. And then we uh, calculate the delay time because let's say for ship it, it should be within 16 hertz cycle. If we use the the STM32 on the 72 megahertz, we will not see anything on the screen because it will run in the super fast speed and we will not know what's going on. That's why we need to also to manage the old uh, original uh, system cycle time. Hello, hey, uh, we're let's... running out of time, I'm afraid. Oh, okay. So running I a bit think late. that's for, for, yeah, so, sorry for that. So uh, that's, that's, uh, I think that's for everything. For just uh, let me see the line for uh, choosing the room. So you see this load application. If we just comment it and load the other one, it will uh, choose the other game. Or we can build and it will run. Uh, and anyone can update any game based on that and can test that. Okay, thank you everyone. Have a nice day. <laughs> well, thank you, Laurie. Uh, sorry to, although, uh, you know, sorry to leap in there. You know, it's, I'm in charge of keeping the schedule and everyone will shout at me. <laughs> yeah, no worries. Uh, if, you, if anyone's got any questions, uh, this would be a really good time to post them here. Um, and I should point out, uh, unfortunately, in the presentation, RT Studio ID seems to be running a bit slow. But in the real world, it runs really, really well. I mean, you can agree with that, right? It was just, yeah, I yeah, think, I that, agree. you know, we've got the network slowing things down and all the cameras and everything else. But in the mm. real world, that would have gone just the smoothest butter. Um, yeah, exactly. So this question here, is your code available to download? I will, uh, I will just uh, recap it and put it on the GitHub. I will share the link soon. That would be great. 